morning. Welcome to Redeemer Presbyterian Church as we are meeting here on the first Lord's Day in the year 2021. I just want to say as we begin this new year, how much as your pastor, I appreciate everybody and your commitment to the church. You know, it's, there's not a week that goes by these days where I don't read something about uh, the church and people are quitting the church and people are coming back to the church and the so-called demise of the church. But I really appreciate it. I, I do. At, uh, our gathering here at Redeemer has remained committed and continues to see the importance uh, of the Lord's Day in the public worship. So I just wanted to say that as we begin our year 2021. We don't know what is before us. The Lord does. So we rest in His sovereign grace. If you have a worship folder that's in your queue there for you already, you can see we're coming to the Lord's table this morning. So we'll uh, hope and pray that God will have our hearts duly prepared to come to that sacrament. On the back page of the worship folder, uh, you can read about things going on in our church. There's one announcement under the announcement section I want to bring to your attention. Uh, if you would possibly be interested in uh, joining our church uh, from time to time, we offer a new members class. And so you can see my email has been placed there. So if you're interested, uh, give me an email, and we're going to try to pull together some folks uh, concerning new membership here in our church. So make, make note of that if that applies to you. Now let us uh, look to the Lord during this prelude that our hearts might be prepared to worship. Him. patiently for the Lord, and He turned to me and He heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire, and He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, O Lord, my God, are the wonders you have done. The things you planned for us, no one can recount to you. Were I to speak and tell of them, they would be too many to declare. Let us pray. Father God, as we find ourselves here on this first Lord's Day in the year 2021, we are ever thankful that you have seen us through this past year with all of its ups and downs and different types of challenges. And so, Father, we are here this morning because you are always putting in our heart, as David says, a brand new song. 
a song of praise to you. For you have lifted us up in Christ, and we are yours. And so, Father, gathered in your presence this morning, we are here to declare your greatness and your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing and join us as we open up our worship singing. The sands of time are singing. You'll, you'll find the words to our first hymn printed in your worship folder.
very consistently, very faithfully, bring to our attention the presence of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, that we continue to fall short in our sinful ways of what He would have us to do. He tells us in His Word in no uncertain terms that I would have my people be a humble, repentant, and contrite people concerning their sin. So as we continue our worship this morning, we're going to turn to the Lord in prayer, repent of our sins, and ask Him humbly to forgive us. Join with me. Father, in all of the ages past, and even to this very moment, on this very day, You are our great Helper. You are the Lord who is our God. We thank you for your grace and mercy which we have experienced from the very day that we came to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And now, Father, as we continue to walk with our Lord uh, headlong now into the year 2021, uh, we know that our struggle against sin, our battle against the sinful nature has not ceased. It continues on moment by moment, day by day. And so, Father, now we turn to you in the quietude of our heart not being prideful about our sin, not being arrogant in your presence, but being humble, confessing it, repenting of it, and asking you to forgive. Well, Father, we have turned to you, and we have in our hearts confessed our wrongdoing and our sinfulness. And we are thankful that even uh, in this worship service, what we receive from you is grace and forgiveness. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Words of assurance in your folder this morning. Just a brief word from Proverbs, but a very, very powerful <coughs> reminder of why it is that we come to the Lord, repent of our Sins. Let us in unison be reminded of what Solomon says in Proverbs 28. He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. I love finding compassion, don't you? As believers this morning, let's make use of the Heidelberg Catechism. We're all the way now to question and answer 53, which is, uh, focusing on the Holy Spirit, you know, we confess that we believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So let me ask the question, if you would please answer in unison. Question 53, what do you believe concerning the Holy Spirit? First, He is together the Father and the Son, true and eternal God. Second, He is also given to me. Join with me as I lead us in a time of <laughs> Father, with our lips we have just confessed what you teach us in the word of the third member of the glorious Trinity. Father, thank you for sending to us and you as well, Christ, as you promised that you would send the Comforter, the Paraclete, the one who would come along a side of us who would lead us into all truth, who would regenerate us and make us alive in Christ and fill us with the very presence of God. We thank you, O Holy Spirit. We thank you for your ministry and your presence in our lives, for what we have just confessed, that you have made it so that we can share in all the benefits of Christ, that we can be comforted by you, O Holy Spirit. So we thank you. Father, we come in your Son's name in prayer, making requests and petitions this Lord's Day, because when we look at all that is around us in our personal life, in our culture, in our society, Lord, there are so many things for which we have not the answer, nor the strength, nor the understanding to do even what we think we would want to do, Lord, so that's why we lean upon you and not our own understanding. That's why we pray to you, O Lord. We think of your kingdom work, Lord, of your church, which is growing day by day in its expanse from one corner of the earth to the other, crossing all cultural barriers, crossing all language barriers. Lord, you are building out your glorious kingdom. 
We pray this morning for Jeff and Jamie Garrett, our good friends who minister over in India. As far as we know, they are still detained here in America, not yet able to return to India. The country is still closed, but Father, we pray soon that that country would open up again, that the Garretts could travel there and again resume what you've called them to, with Jeff teaching there in the college, and all of the other types of ministry that they have to the people of India. Lord, for our congregation here at Redeemer, we look to you as we enter into a brand new year, the year 2021. We pray, O oh Lord, for your blessings. We pray that you would so lead us and guide us as a congregation that we would clearly see what your will is for us as a church. That you would watch over our families, our marriages, Lord, our covenant children, and that you would show us how best to serve you and how the way is best forward for us as a congregation here at Redeemer. Lord, we pray for those who are not well, who are in need of your physical healing touch. We pray for our brother Art Baker, who on tomorrow will be going up to Macon to the hospital to have the heart ablation procedure. We pray that he would have a very calm spirit as he and Janice make their way up to Macon. Pray for the doctors and nurses who will attend to him. And we hope that it will be a rather routine procedure that they can return quickly and he can be back to his everyday life. We pray for those afflicted with the COVID, continuing to pray for Esther Marie Lawrence and others that we know of that are struggling with this virus. And just pray that you bring healing and give strength to those who are weakened by it. And finally, Lord, we close our prayer this morning remembering this nation in which you have made us to be citizens. Uh, there's very important meetings that are going on in our nation's capital this coming week when the Congress and the Senate will gather to make decisions about the electoral votes. Lord, we pray that your will would be done. That's all we ask, humbly, Lord, is that your will would be done. And we know that you are the sovereign Lord over all things. So we fear not, we are anxious not. We are trusting in you, Lord, for your will to be done this nation in which we live. Father, we bring these words of prayer, these requests, and these petitions with great thanksgiving before your throne of grace in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Old Testament reading, which correlates with uh, 1 John chapter 4, where John is going to talk to us uh, about uh, those who oppose the kingdom of God. He's going to talk to us about those who teach false doctrine, those who promote things that are not of the Lord. Well, it wasn't John the Apostle who was the first to ever speak about the need for God's people to stand in light of the fact that there are many, sometimes even amongst God's people, who do not teach the truth. In the book of Jeremiah, in the 23rd chapter, I think you'll pick up rather quickly what the Lord is saying to the ancient Israelite people concerning this very issue. Hear the word of the Lord. I have heard what the prophets say who prophesy lies in my name. They say, I had a dream, I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of those lying prophets who prophesy the delusions of their own minds? They think the dreams they tell one another will make my people forget my name, just as their fathers forgot my name through Baal worship. Let the prophet who has a dream tell his dream, but let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. For what has straw to do with grain, declares the Lord? Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? Therefore, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who steal from one another's words, supposedly from me. Yes, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who wag their own tongues and yet declare, the Lord declares. Indeed, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, declares the Lord. They tell them and lead my people astray with their reckless lies, yet I did not send or appoint them. They do not benefit these people in the least, declares the Lord. When these people or a prophet or a priest ask you, what is the oracle of the Lord? Say to them, what oracle? I will forsake you, declares the Lord. If a prophet or a priest or anyone else claims this is the oracle of the Lord. I will punish that man and his household. This is what each of you keeps on saying to his friend or relative. What is the Lord's answer? Or what has the Lord spoken? 
But you must not mention the oracle of the Lord again, because every man's own word becomes his oracle, and so you distort the words of the living God, the Lord Almighty, our God. This is what you keep saying to a prophet. What is the Lord's answer to you? Or what has the Lord spoken? Although you claim this is the oracle of the Lord, this is what the Lord says. You use the words, this is the oracle of the Lord, even though I told you that you must not claim this is the oracle of the Lord. Therefore, I will surely forget you and cast you out of my presence along with the city I gave to you and your fathers. I will bring upon you everlasting disgrace, everlasting shame that will not be forgotten. Let us now worship the Lord as we give tithes and offerings. Of course, the plates are both in the front and the rear of the sanctuary. going on, especially when it comes to doctrine and teaching, as he's going to talk about false prophets, even the spirit of the Antichrist, again, that we are facing as God's people. Hear the word of the Lord, 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. John says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 
And this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. And whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. <coughs> this is how we recognize the spirit of truth, the spirit of falsehood. This is the reading of this portion of God's holy and inerrant word. You are all familiar as I am with this American proverb which goes something like this. You can fool all of the people some of the time and you can fool some of the people all of the time but you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. And John is talking about efforts, real legitimate efforts that are being made by what he calls false prophets, the spirit of the Antichrist, which is in this world, a real legitimate effort is being made to try to even fool the people of God, to lead us astray, that we might follow some strange, some unorthodox doctrine or, or teaching. So you see what John is bringing to our attention this morning is that in this world, which is a world of spiritual chaos, that God has called His children to be wise, to be discerning, to be men and women who make their stand on the truth, which is God's Word. Now prior to this passage, John has rehearsed us well, has he not, in the law of love? He's talked extensively about the command, the command that we have heard from the beginning, that we are to love one another. We have learned that Christians who obey God and love others from a sincere heart have what? We saw last week. We have a blessed confidence before God. But now John is seeking to call our attention to the spiritual turbulence that is in our world and to show us, as he says we are, what does he say we are? Dear friends, dear children. He wants to show us how to navigate through the spiritual turbulent chaotic world in which we live and serve the Lord. And there's a threefold call sounding out from this passage. Three really clarion calls that are going out to God's people. And I want to look at the first call. It is the call to avoid spiritual gullibility. I believe it was P.T. Barnum, the man who made millions of dollars in the circus industry, who said there is a sucker born every minute. And that was basically his business model for all of his sideshows and whatsoever, that there was a gullible sucker born every minute and he was counting on it. Well, bet your bottom dollar that those who oppose the kingdom of God, the false prophets, the spirit of the Antichrist, they are counting on the fact that we would be finding ourselves as gullible Let's talk about avoiding spiritual gullibility. As John tells us, we ought to be those who avoid such gullibility. And it all begins with being conservative in your spiritual loyalty. The first part of verse 1, he says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit. So that leads one to simply infer that there are many different kinds of spirits that are in the world. There are many spirits at work in the world who are not of God. We must be careful to not foolishly embrace every new spiritual insight or every so-called new spiritual revelation that comes along. Secondly, we must be certain that there is only one spirit, one, solo, uno, just one spirit, that comes from God, for that's what he says in verse 1, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. So our conviction is this. Hear me closely. Our God has not disseminated many different and contradictory spirits in the world. These have not come from God. 
but rather God has sent the one and the only blessed Holy Spirit, just one spirit, just one from God. And our conviction has to be that though there are many competing so-called spirits, there is only one true Holy Spirit from God, and then we must be wise, therefore, unto the spiritual marketplace. For what does John say there in the latter part of verse 1? Because you have to do the things of being spiritually loyal to the Lord and understanding there's one Spirit from the Lord because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So our society, the world in which we live, provides the religious consumer with a plethora of spiritually charged prophets and, and teachers, and religions, and, and on and on goes the opportunity to run after something that is not of the Spirit of God. We know of things that we label the New Age movement and Eastern mysticism, and Scientology, and cults of many different varieties, and on and on and on could go the list of these who are not of God, not of the Spirit of God. Jesus warned us in Matthew 24 when He said, I tell you, many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. So hear me, Christians are expected to be what? Wise under the presence of these false spirits and therefore avoid the pitfall of spiritual gullibility. We have to be wise. Not naive, not ignorant, but wise. Okay, so this is a spiritual world. There are many so-called spirits that are not of God that are promoting all kinds of ungodly and unbiblical and unorthodox things, and we need to be aware of that. Think of the gullibility that goes on when the local carnival rolls into town. I'm sure every one of us has had this kind of experience. You have gone to a local carnival, and what do they have? Over and above the Ferris wheel and the other types of rides, they have the skill games, quote, unquote, right? So the carnival barker begs you to come over and play his game. I played the basketball shoot. Raise your hand if you played the basketball shoot. It's a simple skill game, right? Although the sting, when we think of the basketball shoot, one dollar a shot, make one and wins, is what? Well, the rim is bent. The ball has about 20 pounds too much pressure in it. And you're not very likely to make it. Think about the dart throw. We've all succumbed to the dart throw, right? There's just a bunch of balloons on a board. You're given three darts for a dollar. Pop one balloon and you win. Well, try feeling the tip of that dart next time. How dull is the tip of that dart? How underinflated are those balloons? All of these things are what? Counting on our gullibility that we could win the stuff prize or something like that so very easily. But Christians, as John is saying, even as I read in Jeremiah that the Lord was saying in the day of Jeremiah, we must avoid being so gullible, taken in so easily by things that are not of the Spirit of God. So let me ask, in the practical realm, how then does a Christian learn to avoid spiritual gullibility? John in the first verse just comes out and blanketly says, don't fall for these things, but he goes on and he tells us though, oh this then is how you would literally find yourself equipped to avoid spiritual gullibility. And it has to do with the call to what I would describe as spiritual discernment. There are three steps to biblical discernment of this spiritual realm wherein we live. And John brings these to our attention. Here's the first step. If you would be a discerning man or woman of God, determining that I'm not going to be taken in by false teaching, not going to be gullible to 
things that sound good but are not of God. Here's the first step. We must view the world through spiritual eyeglasses. He says in verse 2, does John, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Recognize the Spirit of God. How do we recognize the Spirit of God? How do we see the Spirit of God or verify the Spirit of God? Well, God would have His children to be skilled in their recognition of the Holy Spirit as well as recognition of false spirits of this world. He would have us to have our eyes open to see what's going on. And the prerequisite for having such skill is acquiring 2020 vision into the spiritual realm. Now here's the fact of the matter. The world in which we exist consists of two major spheres. There is the physical or the material sphere, and then there is the spiritual sphere. And Christians must be cognizant of the spirit realm lest they get caught off guard by their own ignorance. So we need to always be reminding ourselves everything is not material. But there is this vast spiritual dynamic in the world. I believe the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6 sheds much light on what John is drawing our attention to. When, when Paul says in Ephesians 6, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's what we need to be cognizant of. If we're going to be wise unto what is of God and not of God, we need to realize that we are in a world that is just as spiritual as it is material. Now, Jesus, we know, taught His disciples to be aware of the spirit realm. Didn't He? They observed what? They observed spiritual warfare up close and personal. They would be walking along with Jesus, listening to Him teach, and he would come into some village, and oftentimes, what would be the experience of the disciples? Jesus would be confronted with someone who was filled with some type of evil spirit, and Jesus would cast that spirit out. What was Jesus teaching his disciples? That the kingdom of God is in the midst of a vast spiritual dynamic, even a spiritual war. So you see, the backdrop to our spiritual and earthly existence is the very real world of the spirits. And this is the first step to spiritual discernment. John is putting it right in our face. He's telling us, test the spirit. Know the spirits. Be aware of things that are spiritual. But here's the second step. And it delves a little bit deeper because we need to go a little bit deeper than just, okay, God, I got this. There's the material realm. There's the spiritual realm. I've got this. No, Here's the, second, here's the second step. It has to do with judging spiritual credibility on the basis of what is being said, what is being taught, what is being confessed. I want to read verse 2, verse 3. John says, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but... Every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. So listen, I've said this before. God expects us to be those who are capable of making a judgment, a discerning, wise, spiritual, biblical Judgment on the credibility of what is being taught, what is being promoted. What are these people saying? There are two components to any spiritual utterance, any spiritual teaching. There is the message and the messenger. The message and the messenger. For example, let me give you an example out of ancient, uh, ancient history. Suppose some slip-talking, self-proclaimed prophet makes the following spirit revelation. They come along and say, let me tell you this of Jesus Christ. 
They say Jesus Christ of Nazareth was not really a true human being, but instead he was simply a manifestation of God in the form of an angel spirit. Not really the incarnate Son of God with flesh and blood, but just, just an angel spirit. That's what John is pointing out surely in this very text. Who was it that went on and picked up that and taught it and promoted it? His name was Marcion. In the second century he taught this and was declared to be a heretic, but that has not died by any stretch. If you're familiar with an organization called Christ Scientist or Christian Science, they teach that very heresy right in the year 2021. So we know that there are going to be these kinds of things that are going to continue to come at the truth, come at the church and say, have you considered this? Have you heard this? Would you take an earful of this and consider embracing this? Well, how are we to judge such a spiritual revelation? Well, there's the orthodoxy of the message, which must be judged by what? What was Marcion? in the second century judged by. Not the opinions of men, but he was judged by the standard of God's Word. So that's what we do. We, we first hear the message, what is the teaching, and then let's lay it over and against the template of God's Word. And when John chapter 1, verse 14, concerning this specific false teaching that John is speaking of, that there were those who were saying that Jesus is not the incarnate Son of God. What do we know about Jesus? John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh, made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. So simply put, to deny the incarnation is to undermine and validate the very work of Christ. So the Word of God judges the message. John says the Word of God judges the message. But secondly, the orthodoxy of the messenger must then be judged by what? Well, by the orthodoxy of his message. You have a message that's coming. Let's not just judge the message, but let's judge the credibility of the very one who is uttering such a message. Paul speaks to that very issue in Galatians 1, verses 8 and 9. Paul says, But even if we, speaking of himself, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. Hmm. The messenger who delivers a message that is contrary to the gospel is what? Clearly being influenced by a spirit that is not from God, that is foreign to God. And these unorthodox messengers and their unorthodox messages are promoting what John describes as what? What does he call this? The spirit of the Antichrist. He says it's in the world. It's gone out in the world. It's active. It's working hard to try to undo the true teaching of the gospel. The spiritually motivated movement that opposes the kingdom of God is one that we need to be more than prepared to discern. Christians ought to seek to be spiritually discerning following the example of a group in the book of Acts we read about in Acts 17 that were called the Bereans. Listen to how the Bereans were described. Now the Bereans, it says, were of more noble character than the Thessalonians for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. They checked his message, that's Paul's. They checked Paul himself, the messenger, because they wanted to be what John is saying all believers should be. We should be discerning. We need to know the opposition is on the move. That's the third step of spiritual discernment. In other words, we can't have our head ever in the sand. We can't think for a moment that the battle has been won. For in verse 3, what does John say? This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. We can't ignore the spiritual landscape. We can't ignore it. Christians must 
continually and consistently. Be aware that spirits of false doctrine and false religion are manifesting themselves all the time in our society. So this is what John is saying to us as God's people. Not only do we need to be wise enough to understand that there is a spiritual realm, but we need to be wise enough to discern when things come our way. Messages, teachings, movements, philosophies. And can we not say, let's compare what is being said against the Word of God. Let's compare the one saying it against the Word of God. Last night, my son John and I watched a movie called Catch Me If You Can. You ever watched that movie? It's about a young man named Frank Abigdale. And by the time he was 19 years old, he had purported to be a lawyer, a doctor, and an airplane pilot, airline pilot. Of course, he was none of those things. He was a con man. His dad taught him how to be a con man. He became one of the most prolific forgers of checks that had ever existed, according to the FBI. So they caught Frank. They arrested Frank. They incarcerated Frank. But you know what the FBI did with Frank? They said, Frank, we're going to let you out of jail way early if you'll do this. If you'll be the expert and help us understand forged checks. Help us understand by examining these things so we can know what is a real check and what is not a real check. That was ingenious by way of the FBI, was it not? They didn't have anybody in their ranks that could detect what was false. So they hired what? The guy who really knew all things that were false. They wanted to be able to understand and Frank Abagnale had the expertise. He had the discernment. He had the wisdom. Why? Because he himself had so handled false checks in forgeries that he knew a good check from a bad check. That's the kind of people we need to be. When something, as John describes, that is not of the Spirit of God, that is of the Spirit of the Antichrist, that is a false teaching, or as John describes, from a false prophet, we need to be able to handle that, discern it, and make a wise decision whether that is or is not from God. Let's move on and look at this third vital call that John describes, which is upon the life of every believer. And it is the call to speak the truth. The call to speak the truth. In light of being wise and discerning and understanding these things, there's a call upon our lives to speak the truth in verses 4 through 6. The central issue when it comes to spiritual discernment is always, hear me, always the truth. It is God's truth that stands defiantly against the error and falsehood of our age. So let's take a look at what our calling is when it comes to God's truth. What does John say in verse 4 about us? He calls us again, dear children. He says, listen, you dear children, here's the truth. You are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Now those are some powerful truths spoken about us, God's people. There are three distinct truths relating to believers which prepare them for a life of spiritual discernment. In other words, might I say, we are not sent out into this spiritual wild west, which it is, to make wise and discerning decisions, which we must, without being equipped. Here's the first truth about us. We are dear children who are from God. And that God has placed His immutable seal of adoption and acceptance upon us. We are those, my friend, who are born of God and no longer live in bondage to the evil forces of this world. That is true about us. Secondly, John says, this is true about you, dear children. You have overcome them. And that believers have been given the victory over falsehood and error. Believers are no longer naive to the spiritual deceptions of this world. We are not. We are no longer blind. We are no longer deaf. We are spiritually alive. We are spiritually in tune with what is going on so that we would not be overcome by the spirit of the Antichrist or by false prophecies or by these false spirits in the world. The third truth that John says is of us is 
that the one who is in you, he says, is greater than the one who is in the world. And that the person of Christ who dwells in the heart of a believer is immeasurably more powerful than the spirit of error and falsehood in this world. Listen, these truths apply to each and every believer. That's the truth about who we are. We're not some group of weaklings, weak-minded, religious people. We're not. We are exactly what John says we are. We are from God. We are filled with the Spirit of God. And greater is He in us than He that is in this world around us. But we need to understand what we're facing, though, and how important the truth is. Because John says this in verse 5, Now they are from the world, and therefore speak from the, work, from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. John is saying in no uncertain terms, in really clear language, that the unbelieving world is not interested in the truth. They don't care about the truth. John says, because they are from the world. And so, when people come along and they're promoting spiritual error, things that are false doctrine, these people embrace these things. They accept these things because they deny what is really the truth. John says they speak from the viewpoint of the world. The world's viewpoint is what? What is the world's viewpoint? Well, it's all about self. Well, all about building self up and expressing yourself with no fetters, no, no bindings. It's the absence of any ultimate accountability. And John says, that's what we're facing. And you see, gullible unbelievers openly embrace what the world has for them. We should not be surprised that the world believes what it believes because John is telling us. They have no discernment. They just take it in, hook, line, and sinker. Well, what can be done about this plague of spiritual error in the world? Well, believers who refuse to be spiritually gullible and believers who practice the discipline of spiritual discernment, we can do something about this world in which we live. Oh, yes, we can. Oh, yes, we can. When we think about the mass of humanity that is swept up in what John describes as the viewpoint of the world, what can we do about that? Well, look what John closes with in verse 6. He says, We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of of falsehood. So we are called to the unashamed propagation of truth. Those who listen and receive the truth are easily identified as God's children. But what about those who don't? What about those who reject the claims of Christ, reject the doctrine of the Bible? Well, we can infer, as John gives us permission to, we can infer that they are not believers, but we can't stop there. It's one thing to infer discern, decide, okay, that's not of God. That's unbiblical. It's undoctrinal. It's not proper. But we can't just stop there, can we? We need to be reminded of why they don't listen. Why they don't accept the things of God. And in 1 Corinthians 2, it's described like this. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So we need to be diligently applying ourselves to bringing God's truth before this world. We're not just on a defensive posture, my friend. We ought to also be on an offensive posture in that we are taking the truth to the world and we're declaring to them the unchanging truth of the gospel. Yes, are they going to listen all the time? No! John tells us most of the time they're not going to listen. But that doesn't mean we don't keep speaking. 
Listen, if they don't hear the truth of God from the church, what I mean by the church is from God's true people, from God's dear children as we are described here, if they don't hear it from us, where in the world are they going to hear it? From whom are they ever going to hear it? I want to close with a story that goes like this. Story of a man who came to his old friend, a music teacher, and said to him, What's the good news today? The old music teacher was silent as he stood up and walked across the room, picked up a hammer, and struck a tuning fork. As the note sounded out the room, he said, That is an A. It's an A note today. It was an A note 5,000 years ago, and it will be an A note 10,000 years from now. He went on to say, the teacher, the soprano upstairs sings off-key, the tenor across the hall flats on his high notes, and the piano downstairs is out of tune. He struck the A note again and said, that is an A note, my friend, and that's the good news for today. John is telling us about the A note. The good news is that we have the truth. And we can live our lives accordingly. We can live in this world and always know that what we have is the truth. Father in heaven, we thank you for this teaching from your servant John and how it truly does compel us to make every consideration of the world around us, the spiritual marketplace, the spiritual chaos, as John described, the spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit of the world, false prophets and the like that are opposing you and your kingdom. But Lord, nevertheless, you have given us truth. We can stand on the truth and we can propagate the truth. And I pray as we move into the year 2021 here at Redeemer that you would inspire us and motivate us to be men and women of great wisdom and discernment and those who propagate and share the truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and join us as we sing how deep the Father's love for us. You'll find the words printed in your worship folder.
four, speaking of the absolute importance of our believing in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, that He was and is the God-Man. It's so important because He had to be incarnate so that He could come and fulfill the law of Moses give himself over to being cursed by hanging on that cross bodily. And as we come to the Lord's table, we are doing what the Apostle John has exhorted us to do in the passage we looked at this morning. We are discerning who Christ is. We are believing upon the fact that He is the incarnate Son of God who gave His very broken body and life blood so that we might be forgiven. And as we come to the table this morning, I'm going to be reading a passage, not the normal passage that I read, but a passage from 1 Corinthians, no less, where the Apostle Paul is addressing the issue of the Lord's table. Hear these words. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So Paul speaks of the unifying effect of the Lord's table, that we're all believing in the incarnate Son of God and what He did for us. We're all partaking of the same elements. Our faith is in common. Our salvation is in common. And so we're going to come to the table this morning with the faith that God has blessed us with as believers. If you are here this morning and you've never confessed Christ, never believed upon Him for salvation, I'm so glad that you're here. But this table is not for unbelievers or your ability to discern what is really here you don't have that yet but ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins throw yourself upon his mercy he will save you from your sins and then you can come as believers here this morning oh I joyfully invite you to come come and commune with your Lord the Lord is near with us during this time of coming to his table that he might bless us grace us with power and mercy let us pray Father God, we are thankful to be able to participate, as Paul says to the Corinthians, again this morning in the cup and in the bread. Though these are small, even insignificant elements that we shall partake of, they are powerful in what they say to us, that Jesus, You are the incarnate Son of God. That You came and You bled and You died on the cross and were raised from the dead so that we that have salvation. And so, Father, we set aside these elements in their common and everyday purpose. May they serve a holy use among us this morning, reminding us of the incarnate Son of God, Jesus Christ, who bled and died for our salvation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Of course, we're still using the self-contained elements, so in your pew rack, you'll find one. Uh, carefully remove the film on top exposing the wafer, which for us this morning will signify the body of Christ that was broken and torn asunder on that awful day outside of Jerusalem so that we might be saved from our sins. Let us partake of the bread. of the fact that Jesus raised up one of the cups that night at the Last Supper with His disciples. He passed it around that they would all drink of it. And He says, in doing so, you will proclaim my death until I come again. So let us now access the foil, which leads to the cup of juice. 
Let us be reminded of the shed blood of Christ. Let us protect. kingdom which Christ you ordained and instituted for your people that we might have this respite along the long journey that is ours in this world. You might be refreshed and renewed and especially reminded of what you did, O Lord, the incarnate Son of God for us in dying on that cross for our salvation. Father, may we leave this morning from this public worship service filled with Your Spirit, ready to go out into this world and serve You and stand for the truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we're going to receive our deacon's mercy offering by just reminding you that there is an additional plate at both the front and the rear of the sanctuary for you to make contributions to our deacons that they might have resources to uh, distribute mercy inside and outside of our church. Would you please stand as we close out our worship singing hymn number 580, Lead On, O King